Hebrews chapter 11 today. Hebrews chapter 11, start with verse 13. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have re had the opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he's prepared a city for them. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you made. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us. God, as we just uh, go into your word tonight, we just pray for your blessing to be upon us and to strengthen us today and help us to understand what your word is actually saying. We say this in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Christianity is built on the concept of faith. It is by faith we come to God. But the question I want us to look at today and start to wrestle with is what are the challenges of faith? As we come here, we're looking at this passage today, faith is the key word, and we're going to talk about it more. But as we live in this world as Christians, we all are going to have challenges to our faith. And I believe at the heart of this passage here is talking about the challenges of faith that the people of the past have had. You see, Hebrews 11 is often called the Hall of Fame of Faith. As we look at this passage, we go back into the scriptures and start looking at the men and women who by faith did the things that God had promised and did the things that God had commanded and helped us today to celebrate the salvation that we have. For through their faith and their obedience, God was able to bring the Messiah into this world. Now as he does this, as the author of Hebrews discusses their faith, he also discusses something else. He starts talking about their own personal challenges that they had in their faith today. He does this in order to encourage the reader, because as we look at Hebrews, the people that it was originally written to were struggling about staying in the Christian faith. They were tempted to go back into the way of Judaism. So the whole purpose of the whole book of Hebrews is to stay faithful regardless of the challenges you are facing. Today I want us to look at this. What can we learn from the challenges of the people of the past for us today? You see, leading a life of faith is not always easy. I think too often when we look back on the people of Scripture and we, we, we take away, we strip them of, of being actual people, we start reading them sometimes like a character of a book or a movie or something like that, that's the wrong way to read the Scriptures. These were real people with real challenges, real problems, but more importantly with real faith. If we're faithful to the end, just like they were, we will see the glories of heaven. So let's just start right off in this. Now in order to understand this passage and even this sermon, we have to do something very important. We have to define faith. The biblical definition of faith is found in this passage. When you go back to Hebrews chapter 11, you start with verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what is hoped for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commanded, were commanded for. So as we take a look at this passage, there's some key words that describes the word faith. What are they? Number one, faith is being sure. This is not an uncertainty. We'll come back to this in a moment. But it's a concrete assurance of what? The next key word is what we do not see. It doesn't mean that it's not real. It means that in this life, we're not always going to see what God has promised. But the hope that we have is with a certainty that what God has promised, He will bring about. Now with this definition, let's start to look at what we need to know about faith. First of all, faith 
is developed from hearing the Word of God and believing its testimony. Now, let's start with the last part of this first. The testimony. We have testimony of eyewitness, eyewitnesses of the faith of Jesus Christ, of His life, His death, and His resurrection. In the case of the Apostle Paul, who writes Romans, which we're going to turn to, he saw the, the Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. These things that we read about have a testimony based upon the evidence of the people we're talking about here. And the way you develop faith is from hearing the Word of God. Romans chapter 10, starting with verse 9, tells us how the conversion process begins. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So, okay, let's stop right here. The faith element of it is believing the biblical testimony about Jesus Christ. He lived, he died, he resurrected. We go on. <coughs> For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Okay, so this belief that begins in the heart comes out from the mouth of you confessing what you believe to come from the inside here. The scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you want salvation, you've got to come through faith here. Where do we get faith? How then can they call on the one they have not believed? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Faith starts at the hearing of the word. It's at the hearing of the word that the seed is planted that grows in the heart and becomes faith. The purpose of the scriptures is to lead us to faith in Jesus Christ by giving us the evidence of eyewitness testimony. The most powerful testimony even today in a court of law to convict somebody is eyewitness testimony. It is what we still base our history upon. When we go back and we look at history, it's based upon eyewitness testimony. Eyewitness testimony is one of the most powerful things of all time. And when you look at John chapter 20, and you look at 30 to 31, we see that that is what the word is based upon. It's the testimony of those who see and heard. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples. Which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. As we said before, faith is not an empty or confused hope. You see, the problem in the English language is when we start looking at certain words, and sometimes they have different meanings. When I looked at the sky today, I was thinking, I hope it doesn't really rain or storm today. You see, hope is based on uncertainty. But that's not what the Bible is saying here. See, there's another way that the English word uses the word hope. It's not just in an uncertainty, but hope is something that drives us. It motivates us. It moves us. A hope here that is discussing in scriptures in other way the English language uses that word. It is saying what today gives me the strength, what today keeps me out of depression, what today keeps me going in life is the belief in the scripture. It gives me hope, the hope in heaven. It's not empty, it's not confused. It's a hope that gives strength by believing in what is coming in the future. So what is coming? I want you to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is what changes things for Christianity. As you're turning there, look at this. Uh, I was recently watching a, a video online where this woman, she was, you could tell she had been in pain over something. You don't know what it was, she didn't go into it. But she said, what good is Christianity? If I still have to feel pain, 
What good is Christianity if I still have to deal with torture? What good is Christianity if I still have to deal with all this bad in this world? And the guy says, yes, as a Christian, you're still going to deal with the bad in this world. As a Christian, you're still going to deal with the pain and the suffering, the sickness, and all those things. And he says, here's the difference. In Christianity, we basically have the hope in the way of the world view to bring us through. See, here's the thing. You're still going to deal with death. You're still going to deal with sickness. You're still going to deal with pain. You're still going to deal with suffering. You're still going to deal with the tragedies of life. What's the difference? The difference is very plain and simple. You have something that is driving you. A hope that cannot be taken away that Paul talks about here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. He's talking about the saints who have died. Saints here meaning the Old Testament believers who died before Jesus came to the cross and the Christians who died after Jesus came to the cross. All those who are in the kingdom of God. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, talking about those who make it to the very end, who are left to the coming of the Lord, will certainly not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. So what are we looking at here? Very simply is this. The courage, the strength that we have in this world is the fact that we will rise again. That the Christian will see their loved Christian in heaven again. That death is not the end. That Satan does not win. That death does not win. That sin does not win. That we do not end up in hell. The hope that we have is in Jesus Christ. Now that we see what faith is, we need to see how we should live in this world. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 11, starting with verse 7. Hebrews chapter 11, starting with verse 7. By faith, Noah was warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go back to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in a promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he himself was looking forward to a city with its foundations, who architect and builder is God. This morning, when we started the sermon, the text talked about people who left. The text talked about people who did not stay where they're at. Faith moved them. I want to pay, take two of these guys who were moved by faith and did not stay in the evil they were in. Noah and Abraham are two people we talk about a lot. They're two people who, when you talk about faith, are great examples of faith. Noah and Abraham had a choice. They could live like their world, or they could follow God. Can't do both. 
You can't have one foot in the world and one foot with God. At some point, it's like a man who loves two women. He can only make one his wife. You have to make a choice and a decision on who you're going to be with. God or the world. Let's look at Noah first. Noah had to have faith to build an ark in an unbelieving world in the midst of unbelieving people. God told Noah something impossible. I'm going to flood the entire world. There's even debates at this time within certain circles of Christianity whether or not even rain had come on the earth at this point. Noah was told something nobody else would believe. And he said, if you want to live, build an ark. The entire world at that time had surrendered to sin. The entire world at that time had fallen away from God. The entire world decided to go to the flood. By faith, when Noah was told about something yet unseen, believed the testimony, built the ark, left the world behind, found salvation for himself, his family, and then eventually even to us because it was through his life that Jesus also came. The entire world stayed by faith. Noah went. So then there was another man a man named Abraham. Abraham left his home, his people, and his security for a promise that did not make sense. And he died never seeing its full fulfillment. God said that he would have children, even though he and Sarah were past the age to have it. He gave him a land that he would never own. And all for one of the most significant promises found in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 12, start with verse 1. In the, Bible, in the book of Genesis, there are three significant promises. The promise to Eve, the promise to Noah, and this promise to Abraham. The Lord had said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those you bless, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord told him, and the lot went with him. Abram was 75 years, was 75 years old when he set up from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions that he had accumulated, and the people he had acquired in Haran, and they set out the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. An impossible promise. You have a blessing for the entire world. Abraham, who had not even one child, it's going to change the world. He believed in this promise so much, he left his entire family to go where God did not tell him he was going to be there. God just told him when he got there. And when he got there, and he looked at the land, and God says, your descendants, which Abraham didn't have, is going to own this land. Abraham left everything and followed in faith. Faith does not live for the present moment. If you believe that as a Christian you're going to see all the promises of God in this world, somebody told you something wrong. 
does not live for the present moment. For the present moment can disappear in an instant. If you're living for your job, you can be fired tomorrow. If you're living for your brand new house, you can go up in flames. If you're looking for that bank account, we can have an economic crash tomorrow. If you're living for your country, it can be wiped out in an invasion. Everything that you look at physically in this world can be gone in an instant. Faith does not look at the present moment. It looks forward to a promise that we cannot see until the future. Christian, if you're looking for anything from heaven, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Heaven is the only hope we have in this world. It comes through Jesus Christ. By faith, we leave the world behind and follow Christ right into that watery grave of baptism for a new home. And when we leave everything behind, sometimes we can feel like an oddball. The text says that we read this morning that these men often felt like aliens and strangers in this world. That's the way we sometimes feel. And there's a reason for that. Hebrews chapter 11 again, start with verse 24 through 28. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. There's never a person in the Bible who had, that could have had a completely different life. It was Moses. Born a slave, adopted in to the kingdom of Egypt to become a prince. To now have to choose between two worlds. The slave people of God or the ruling power of Satan. See, that's a choice Moses was going to have to make. And as Moses looked at his choices, he saw something. Though raised in Egypt, though made a citizen of Egypt, Moses saw the futility of Egypt and lived for God. Understand what this means. Moses' adopted family were all Egyptians, were trained to be Egyptians, lived according to Egyptian customs. The people who trained Moses, who taught Moses, the people who served with Moses were all people who lived according to Egyptian customs and Egyptian worship. The people that, that Moses would order around for the first 40 years of his life lived for Egypt according to Egyptian customs and lived according to e Egypt's idolatry. He didn't walk in the path of his upbringing. He forsook and became a stranger in his own country to live for God. When Moses came back 
as an 80-year-old man who's seen God, he never lived like an Egyptian again. When we live by faith, we forsake the things that people value in this world. Moses gave up wealth, he gave up power, he gave up fame. He ignored everything all for the cause of God. As Christians, we seek not those things. For those things can take us away from God. The warning that, that Paul gives in Hebrews chapter or excuse me, Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6 reminds us of this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, start with verse 3. If anyone really teaches false doctrine and does not agree with sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and the godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, in constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and when they think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. If we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and commit foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Choose the things of this world or choose God. Can't have fun. Your Christian life should cause you to feel different than the entire world around you. The more this earth turns, the more different I feel from my society. Each day I look at the things the world accepts, the idolatry, the depravity, feel different. And so should you. You shouldn't feel like you belong here. The problem is, Adults really never grow up. We're just big kids. What's the biggest fear that kids have in school? Other people won't like me. I'm different. They're going to make fun of me. We teach our kids sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And then we run off to work, and what are we afraid of? We're afraid that people won't like us to be a Christian. We're afraid somebody's going to make fun of us for a Christian belief. We spend time with friends and family who are not believers, and we're hoping they don't ask us questions about faith. We watch that TV show that makes a <laughs> joke about Christianity and start to feel a little shame. Because they're laughing at us. <clears throat> if you live by faith, you will be different. And you've got to get comfortable with it. Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 17, talks about the differences between a Christian and a non Christian. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as Gentiles in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separate from God, from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. <coughs> Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, to indulge, to indulge in every kind of impurity, with continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ in that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him according with the truth in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life 
Put off your old self, which is being corrupted by the deceitful desire, to be made new in the attitude of your mind, and to put the new self created to be like in God in the true righteousness and holiness. Here's the point he's making. You're going to be different. Every day you should be shedding off that sin and depravity like a, like a snake will shed its skin. You don't live like the world. And if the world mocks us, if the world laughs at us, so what? Like Noah, the world can choose the flood, you can choose salvation. Like Moses, Egypt can choose its idols, you can choose God. Tough enough. Except being different. Just keep your salvation. As Joshua said, so should we say today, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. For when we live for God, he is not ashamed of us. In the text that we read again earlier today, it talked about the fact that God was not ashamed to be their God. Why? Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And without faith, it's impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists. He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. It's by faith that you are saved, through or by grace. Not your good deeds. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not yourself, it's the gift of God. Our world believes that if you're just a good person, you're going to go to heaven. It's not good people, it's perfect people. You say, well, I'm not perfect. You just took your first step to the plan of salvation. Recognizing your unworthiness. The next step is to understand that Jesus Christ died to make you perfect. That's the next step in your way of salvation. Understanding that it's by grace you have been sanctified and that you have been raised to a new life. The first step is faith. Faith is believing in Jesus and being willing to confess Him in word, follow Him into baptism. What do you got to believe about Jesus Christ? Matthew chapter 16, 15 through 18. If you ask people who is Jesus Christ, some will say he was a historical figure. Some will say he was the figment of people's imagination. Some will say he was a prophet sent by God and has been corrupted. Some will say he was a madman that believed he was God. But your answer must not be any of those if you want salvation. It must be the same answer that Peter gave, for it was the only answer Jesus ever accepted. Matthew chapter 16, starting with verse 15. What about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will never overcome it. The statement that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God, is the statement upon which the church is built. Once you come to the standpoint that you understand your sinfulness, and you understand who Jesus is, you have to, by faith, walk into the watery grave of baptism. 
You will confess his name before other people. You will proclaim him and you will follow him in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Faith leads us there. Though as the waters lifted Noah's ark away from the sin, the blood of Jesus touches us in the water grave of baptism and lifts us away from a life of sin. <coughs> It is through faith that the Savior will claim us and the Father to accept us. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. If you were on trial for murder, would you not want a perfect attorney? Would you not want the attorney that's never lost? Now imagine, I know this doesn't really happen, but imagine it could that the lawyer's father was the judge. Do you like your odds a little bit better now? On the day of judgment, you will be appearing before the judge. Do you want the son to be your advocate? This is what he says. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. And whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Do you wear the name of Christ proudly today? Is there anybody who can back you down like the servant girl did to Peter on the night Jesus was betrayed? Do you want to be accepted by the Father? By faith, confess the Son. You see, our God accepts those who walk and live by faith. Hebrews chapter 11 is the testimony about that. Those people walked by faith, believed in faith, acted on their faith. We've got to follow their example. For as God is not ashamed to be called their God, if we follow their example, our God is not ashamed of us. And of everybody that we have to be worried about looking down upon us, God is the only one we are to fear. Because he's the only one with the sight. Fear God. We must live like our heroes. I don't mean the heroes of the ball field. I don't mean the heroes on the, the battlefield. I don't mean the heroes of history. I mean the heroes of faith. People who persevered through the challenges of faith for the hope of the gospel. They had their eyes fixated on something they could not see. They had their eyes fixated on what their ears heard. They had their eyes fixated on what their minds could only imagine because they did not see. They didn't see the Son of God come into this world. And that night we celebrate every year. They did not see him walking on water and turning water into wine. They didn't get to see the death, the burial, and the resurrection. But today they get to see the glories of heaven because by faith, they follow the path of God and forsook the world. If you want to see that same glory, you've got to follow in their example. Are you living as a person of faith today? That's a question only you can answer. Preacher can't answer it for you. Family member can't answer it for you. You have to live as a person of faith. What's keeping you from the gospel today? Ask yourself this question. Whatever that thing is, is it worth the fires of hell? Is it worth missing the glories of heaven? Step out today in faith to make your decision to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, give the Holy Spirit, and rededicate your life.
Make your decision today as we stand and sing your potential song.